Yo, what is going on everybody? Dan Tripter here and welcome back to my tutorial series, Browser Noise. This is tutorial number six and today, first of all, I want to quickly review two important aspects of our project so far. We have an amplitude slider that controls the volume of our noise and we're plotting the energy of the frequency on the canvas. If you are ever programming audio dealing with amplitude or frequency, which needless to say happens all the time, and you find yourself using the default linear values from that slider to control the amplitude, or if you are plotting spectrum through some sort of linear mapping or using, again, a, a linear slider, pause. Okay. Sadly, or if you're like a nerd and love this stuff excitingly, we audio programmers will often have to compensate for the fact that we do not perceive amplitude or frequency in a linear fashion. You might have already noticed that something is a little bit suspicious about the slider. When I move the knob like literally six pixels in, it's suddenly kind of loud and our points, which represent the energy of the sound, are almost a third of the way to the top. And if I were to like move the slider at a steady rate towards the max, you'll see, oh, that's a little loud, but you'll see that the rate at which the points move up to the ceiling is not the same. It slows even though I'm moving the, the slider at a steady rate, if that makes sense. So while we're still able to control the volume and everything is fine in that sense, like this works, you know, it is still kind of ideal to make that control match what we are perceiving. All right, so how do we do this? So remember that Mr. Noisy.amp is expecting a number typically between zero and one so that under the hood, what it can do is it can take that value, that constant, and multiply all of the samples in the signal by that value. Just to show what it would look like under the hood if we were to say, pass in a 0 0.5 into Mr. Noisy.amp, I wanna just show that it would essentially take every single sample in the signal and multiply it by 0.5. And remember, these are samples that are somewhere in the range between negative one and one. So this sample, which is kind of close to one, after it gets multiplied by 0.5, will end up at a 0.5, right? The first sample, which is negative 0.4, will end up at negative 0.2. The second sample, which was negative 0.6, will end up at negative 0.3. This one will be like 0.1 and so on. It'll go through every single sample. This one, which is like a zero, will of course be zero still because zero times 0.5 is still zero, right? So that's essentially what's happening if we were to pass in a 0 0.5 into Mr. Noisy.amp. When we make signal modifications like this, the intensity at which the air molecules will oscillate from our speaker cone will essentially be cut in half. However, we will not necessarily hear this as half the volume. And this is due to the fact that our ears and our brain <laughs> interprets loudness, not on this sort of intensity scale or Pascal scale, but on a logarithmic scale or in units of decibels. I'm sure you've all seen charts like this one, but I want you to notice the massive range of intensity, the column with the units watts per meter squared, and notice how it differs from the decibels scale. Imagine, we'll have a little sort of thought experiment. Imagine you are having a conversation with someone and you're talking at a reasonable 60 decibels. And then the other person is all rude, as, as is the case sometimes, and then jumps in and talks over you. In this case, we have two people talking simultaneously and the intensity of the sound would indeed more or less double, but we perceive the loudness as having only increased by a little bit. It won't sound as though the loudness doubled. If it did, I mean, 
Imagine what it would sound like to be at a football stadium with thousands of people yelling. Your head would, uh, I guess, explode, probably. So we typically want our like human-controlled volume sliders to be in units that we humans understand. That is, in decibels, if that makes sense. We have to decide on an amount of decibels to represent our dynamic range. So I'm going to just go ahead and choose 60 dB. This can be anything, but this is what I'm deciding. And we're going to consider this a slider that serves to attenuate the signal from 0 dB. So the range of our slider is going to be something like negative 60 dB to 0 dB. And so let's just go ahead and indeed make that the range of our slider, negative 60 to zero, and then, and then initialize it to negative 60 and make a step size of one. Now we want to convert those decibels to amplitude and there's a really common formula to do this. It's all over the interweb if you look for it and it is amplitude equals 10 to the decibels over 20, okay? And we're going to use a POW function, and it takes two arguments. The first argument is the base, and the second argument is the exponent. To get the amplitudes that we're going to pass into MrNoisy.amp, we are going to say POW, and then the base is 10, and the exponent is set volume dot value, which is, remember, the decibels, over 20. So let's go ahead and do that down here just by saying pow 10 to the set volume dot value over 20. Boom. All right, fabulous. Now when I hit run and then play and now increase the slider. That feels a whole lot more like a standard slider, right? There is an issue though. Let's bring it all the way back to, to zero and then get really close to your speakers. You'll probably hear that it's not at zero right now. It's actually at a very, very small number, but it's very, very much a non-zero number, right? You'll find that although it doesn't seem like a clean solution at all, many volume sliders that you use on a daily basis use either some sort of table lookup system or something like this where the input is split into different parts treating the very quiet end linearly uh, so as to make sure the quiet end actually does get to zero and it also accounts for limited bit depth. Feel free to spend some time tempering with it to your liking. This is not an exact science. It's good for now though so let's move on. We have an equivalent issue in the frequency domain. Apparently this means frequency. I'm thinking about the x-axis of our graph. And if you are a musician, you're often thinking in terms of notes rather than frequency. And of course this makes sense because we have this system called the equal tempered scale. And the idea of that is the perceived distance between say a D and an E flat is going to sound the same as the distance between an E flat and an E natural. Likewise, an A4 and an A5, that distance, an octave apart, is going to sound the same as the distance between an A5 and an A6, an octave above that. Here's the thing. If we look at the frequencies of those notes, however, of those A's, they're not linearly spaced. The distance between 440 and 880 is, of course, 440, whereas the distance between 880 and 1760 is 880, right? To account for this, let's drop down and go into our draw function and simply take the log of our index number. Now, when I hit run, you'll see it's... it's the math is correct, but we're scaled incorrectly. So all I'm going to do is take the log of spectrum.length, which is going to help scale it to the width of the canvas. Now check this out. Oh my God. Okay, amazing. So if we look at pink noise, 
Now that we're plotting our spectrum logarithmically, you'll notice there's a linear descent, which is precisely what we'd expect to see considering that the main feature of pink noise is that each octave has equal energy rather than white noise in which each frequency band has equal energy, if that makes sense. In the case of pink noise, there is a minus 3 dB attenuation as you increase the octave by one, doubling the frequency, right? Cool? Yep. That's it for today. We still need to improve the look of our spectrum, but we are going to do that in the next tutorial, and that will be the last tutorial for the sort of intro project to the browser noise series. I'll see you in the next one later.